So today, I'd like to talk about the relativity of happiness. Let's begin with the words of Shinran Shonin. To realize Shinjin oneself and to guide others to Shinjin is among difficult things, yet even more difficult. To awaken beings everywhere to great compassion is truly to respond in gratitude to the Buddha's benevolence. The words of Shinran Shonin, which you can find in the chapter on true Shinjin in the Pure Land Way. Uh, which is part of the Kyogyo Shinsho, which you can find in the collective works of Shinran. No, no, no. So good morning. So yeah, again, I'd like to address the idea uh, that happiness is relative. But let's, let's think about that, right? What is happiness? And why do we spend our lives in the pursuit of happiness? And I think maybe more importantly, why am I not happy? So author um, Arthur uh, Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher, created this framework. Sorry, wrong slide again. That's OK. Um, actually, Charles Schultz, right, the Peanuts uh, cartoonist, said it best. Happiness is a warm blanket, Charlie Brown. We'll be returning to that. So this, this slide. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so Arthur Schopenhauer, the great German philosopher, created this framework for understanding happiness. So happiness right, is the ratio that's the fraction right, of what I have in the numerator on the top and what I want in the denominator right, in the bottom. Right? So what I have divided by what I want. And this results in a ratio of relative happiness. So if what I have is greater than what I want, I am happy. If what I have is less than what I want, I am not happy. Absolutely brilliant insight and, and a very good framework for looking at this, this, this question. So, the question to us this morning, is your happiness a negative number or a positive number? The things you want relative to the things you have. And this explains the paradox of the American dream. The more that you have, the more you want. The more that you acquire, the more that you're not happy. Why? Why? The Buddhist perspective on this uh, insight expands into expands what I have into desires fulfilled and what I want into desires unfulfilled. So from an advertising perspective, the formula always considers three things, needs, wants, and desires. And these are all consumer mindsets that advertisers and advertising agencies appeal to. So needs, now the basic needs for air, water, food, clothes, shelter, the things you need to survive. Right? If you don't have your basic needs, all this other stuff doesn't apply. Wants. Okay, so once you've satisfied your basic needs, you want more. I want a house or a bigger house. I want a car or a faster car. I want money or I want more money. And then there's desires. More, more, more. And I secretly want everything. So advertising aims to fan the flames of insatiable desire. Right? Desire that cannot be satisfied. Right? We want to, advertisers, man, advertising agents, we want to fan those flames. We want to make it worse. We want to burn with desire to buy my client's product. <laughs> Which is exactly what Shakyamuni Buddha identified as the cause of all suffering, discontent, and unhappiness in human life. Right? We are driven by self-centered desires that can never be satiated, that can never be satisfied. And thus, we live in a world where happiness is measured by what we have. But somebody else always has more. And we compare ourselves. Well, I have this, I have this, but she has that. Ah, I want that. And thus, we are doomed to be unhappy. Desired fulfilled. Desires fulfilled versus desires unfulfilled. Now, as you know, the goal of Buddhism is to extinguish the flames of insatiable desire. Uh, and this will end. So if you eliminate the cause of suffering, you can eliminate suffering. The question, of course, is how? So what happens when the ratio of what you have versus what you want is zero? What happens when the ratio of what you have versus what you want is one? So these are two approaches to happiness in Buddhism. So in Buddhism, happiness can be defined as, right? So how do we make that, you know, the, is it what I have, uh, you know, relative to what I want is zero. So remember your math, and, and as, as you all know, my math is pretty weak, right? But if you make the numerator zero, 
then the value, right, or the fraction is zero. So, right, if you have no possessions, if you have nothing, you have no attachments. Give up everything, become a monk. Shave your head, give me your money, give me your clothes, give me your horse. Right? Go run off to the mountains and, and, and you know, live the monastic life. You have to give up everything. Right? So, right? you can make the numerator zero, give up everything. Now, if I remember my math correctly, the, the, the denominator, the bottom part of a fraction, can never be zero. It's just, it's not allowed. Right? So think about that. It is mathematically impossible to eliminate what I want, the bottom part. Right? It's, it's impossible to eliminate desire. And remember, in Buddhism, nirvana literally means to extinguish, to blow out. And in this case, to extinguish the flames of insatiable desire, uh, insatiable thirst. Uh, it's usually translated as desire. Uh, in Sanskrit, apparently, it means thirst. And thus, nirvana could be defined as a state of needing, wanting, and desiring Nothing. Nothing. And this is the path of sages, the Theravada approach of renunciation of this world, turn your back on this material world, uh, monastic life, all the rules of a monk, and total commitment to realizing nirvana, right, the extinguishing of insatiable desires you know, in this life, in this body. Now, let's, what happens when the numerator and denominator are exactly equal? In other words, what happens when, when what I have and what I want are in perfect balance? If you're content with what you have, and if there's nothing you desire, then you're happy, aren't you? So why am I not happy? Because my ego insists right, that I need, want, and desire more, 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 more. In other words, my ego keeps making the denominator bigger. I want more. Right? While the, the numerator, right, what I have now, stays the same. So mathematically, it is intuitively obvious this will never lead to happiness. And again, begs the question, what is happiness? And is happiness relative? Right? Is happiness the ratio of what I have versus what I want? Is my happiness only relative to what I have versus what other people have? Is my happiness defined by what I want or by what other people want? Why are we obsessed with pursuing happiness? Even if we can intuitively understand the pursuit of my personal happiness is not making me more happy. Or is there an absolute happiness? So happiness in the realm of human existence, this realm of confusion and delusion in which we live, right, this by definition is relative. So is it possible? to achieve absolute happiness. Shin Buddhism teaches, when you truly care about the happiness of others more than your own happiness, right, which we've used as the state of regarding each being as one's only child, the realization of Byodoshin, the mind and heart of absolute equality, that this is Buddha nature, and we will realize it when we are born in the Pure Land. The original Sanskrit word for the Pure Land is Sukhavati, uh, or the realm of ultimate bliss, ultimate bliss, ulti absolute happiness. Okay, so the pure land, birth in the, going forward to birth in the pure land, you know, the pure land is the realm of ultimate bliss, absolute happiness. Uh, in Japanese, it's referred to as gokuraku, right, gokuraku jodo. Uh, and because we're human, right, limited by our all too human mind and body, uh, Amida's great compassion calls out to every sentient being, offering refuge a path to becoming Buddha through the assurance of going forth to birth in the Pure Land, Sukhavati, the realm of absolute happiness. So when you truly hear the calling voice of Amida, Namo Amida, but you truly, truly realize, you come to realize, you are brought to realize, life is not about me. Right? It's not about me. It's not about my ego. Right? Life is not about my happiness. It's not about me. It's not about me. And then, as in today's children's drama story time, you become empowered to share everything that you have. And when people share everything they have with you, right, you, me, I become humbled because this person is sharing everything with me. I become grateful because I don't deserve this. And I say, 
mahalo. I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. The act of saying, expressing gratitude, not just feeling gratitude, but saying it is part of it. So when everyone is humble and grateful and always saying mahalo, always saying thank you, then the community is happy. And this is the state of Xinjin, the realization of the faith of Xinjin in your heart and mind, the state of treating every living being as your only child. It's not about me. It's not about me. So the path of uh, Shin Buddhism begins and ends with saying Nam Wami Dabutsu. When we truly hear the calling voice of Nam Wami Dabutsu, a transformation begins, guiding us to the experience of gratefully receiving the faith of Shinjin through the working of Amida Buddha in our lives. So just say it. Nam Wami Dabutsu. Just say Mahalo. And thank you very much, uh, Mahalo, for listening this morning, and may your day be filled with aloha. And we're going to change sets again, so give us a second.